from Microbe TV. This is Tweevo, This Week in Evolution, episode number 31, recorded on May 17th, 2018. I'm Vincent Rackinello, and you are listening to the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Joining me today from Salt Lake City, Nels LD. Hello, and uh, good day from LD Lab Studios. Good to be with you. You have nice weather out there? Yeah, it's gorgeous. So we are in one of the best times of the year, where I'm just looking out my office window now, across to the Ochre Mountain Range, and there's just a little wisp of, a little wisp, I should say, of snow here and there, but wow. the gar- the gardeners <laughs> time this uh, melt. So as that will go away completely, that's when you're meant to plant your tomato seedlings. Neat. And so this is our, this is happening. Spring is in full full voice. Well, here it's raining, 17 Celsius. It's been raining Oof. since yesterday. It's going to yeah, rain the rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> it's coming in and some flooding, maybe not in New York, but I thought I thought I saw something in Boston or it's uh really an inundation. Is that happening in New York as well? I haven't seen any flooding, but it's been raining. Well, I I had a delayed return from California yesterday. We had to divert mm. and stay overnight elsewhere because of the storms and I mm. when we landed yesterday it was raining. It rained all afternoon, all night. It's raining today. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's <laughs> and you know the problem when it rains is that more people drive because they don't want to take mass transit, and then the sure. roads get crowded and get accidents. Mm. It's just a uh, what do you call when it all piles up? Gridlock. Yeah, gridlock. It's like <laughs> perfect storm of of stuff. Yeah. Well, hopefully it'll kind of wash away any winter residues, and things will start popping in the yeah the trees and grass and everything else. You know, our buddies over at the microbiology department at the Icon School of Medicine want you to know about some job openings. They're looking for faculty candidates interested in strengthening their program in virus-host interactions. Applicants must hold a PhD and or MD, have postdoctoral experience, and be interested in creating a virus-related research group that will complement the pre-existing departmental program. Recruitment of individuals or couples at the level of assistant, associate, or full professor will be considered. More information about the department and the school can be found at icon.mssm.edu. And if you'd like to apply, send your CV and a brief description of your research plan to nycvirology at gmail.com, or you can contact Ben Tenover directly. Do you have your satellite meeting, Nels? We did, yeah. So I've been promoting this the last few episodes of Twevo. This was a Society for Molecular Biology and Evolution satellite meeting. It happened last week. It was really fun, and uh, I would say successful. I was really happy with how it turned out. So we had about 80, 85 folks from around the world, actually. It was an international meeting. And what was really, I think, great about it was we had a lot of folks who are sort of early in their training, so grad students and postdocs, um, giving talks about their work. And it was just kind of, in as it was coming together, you never know how it's going to unfold. But as a collection of talks, it just left me really inspired to see all of the exciting work that's sort of bubbling up, um, thinking about really cool ideas at the interface of evolutionary and experimental biology. And I just left kind of um, with a bounce in my step for thinking about <laughs> <laughs> some of the some of the great things happening and just really skilled people who are attacking questions and problems in really meaningful ways. So nice. Yeah, it was fun. Exhausting, um, but also really fun. Uh, but you didn't have to travel far, so that's nice. <laughs> well, that's true. Although I've learned uh, this uh, lesson for local science meetings, which is, it is great that you don't have to travel, but if you're going to it, don't go all in. So, you know, stay at the location, yeah, the hotel or yeah, the resort. Yeah. Don't try to live your life sort of in one foot in meeting life and one foot in uh, usual life. You kind of have to go for it. And so yeah, well, the, we did the, it. The post-meeting uh, stuff is the best part sometimes, right? Mm. So if you go home, mm-hmm. you're going to miss it. So you just stay at the hotel at the, with the meeting? Yeah. So one of the great things about um, sort of local meetings in my neighborhood is, especially this time of the year, is there are all these ski resorts with really fancy 
uh, lodges, mm-hmm. um, you know, kind of not, it's not just a hotel room. It's like a condo basically. Yeah, and, yeah. um, the ski season's over. And so, um, there's no one there except for the <laughs> scientists and other <laughs> sort of groups and conventions or whatever. And so, um, really comfortable accommodations. It's almost perfect for, um, those, you know, post session conversations and receptions and, um, you know, sort of late evening conversations. Yeah, totally. Mm-hmm. I remember that at the uh, museum when we had our little Tuivo there that was nice. We could hang at the museum. Yeah, that was fun. That was another fun one. Well, not overnight, but um, yeah, night yeah at, good location. Night at, night the, night museum. at the museum. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there is actually a uh, molecular biology group here at the Museum of Natural History in New York. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I've always wanted to go there and do some kind of a podcast, uh, you know, after hours, sit, sit in front yeah. of the dinosaurs. Yeah, no, no, I, that's right. That's kind of what we did here yeah. right, with our Twivo. It was, and I think, I really think there is something to this of combining sort of, you know, modern meetings or events with uh, museums to kind of connect things all the way through and sort of put it into, uh, you know, breathe real life into it. Mm-hmm. We kind of had an echo of that in this meeting as well. So actually the first night, um, the keynote um, address, which was given by Frances Brodsky. So she's director of um, biosciences at University College London and is scientifically probably best known for her structural and functional um, work, groundbreaking work on clathrin and clathrin mediated endocytosis. So kind of pure cell biology. And um, what she's done in, in the meantime, or more recently, is to move her work into thinking about sort of the evolutionary implications of diversity of clathrin. There are different forms, light and heavy chains, and even duplications that have happened specifically in some lineages. And she's linking that to some metabolic differences in species as well. It's really interesting. But anyway, so her keynote address was, um, or seminar, was at a new cell center on campus here, which is actually a repurposed um, it's the old location of the Natural History Museum. Mm. And so it has a little echo or a little feel for those old days. So the auditorium was the room, that the sort of massive room that used to house dinosaurs. And in fact, there's still <laughs> a couple of casts of um, triceratops-like dinosaurs on the wall. And so it has a little bit of that feel to it. It's really fun to kind of kick off the meeting there and then go up to the resort in the mountains. And nice. Take it, take it from there. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Love it. Mm. Uh, I was at uh, a very brief one half day meeting at Irvine on Monday. Oh, nice! It was about, what was the? What was, was the a, occasion? It was about vaccines. We had three speakers mm. who talked about different aspects of virus vaccines and uh, mm. trying to address some of the public hesitation with vaccines. Mm-hmm. And so, mm-hmm. and we did a twiv after. So there were three talks, and then we took the three speakers, and Rich Condit and I did a twiv with them. Oh, and great we, idea! We, you know, we had an audience of about. 50 people. Hmm. And so this is a good episode for vaccines to sort of explain some of the myths. We did some myth busting. <laughs> yeah, great. That was fun. Yeah, and some of this, that's cool. And some of the strategies, I guess, to um, promote vaccination, I'm guessing, as well. Yeah, right? yeah, and mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. So we, we actually got very basic in the TWIV, which will be out in a couple of weeks. That was, no, keep was an, good. I'll keep an eye out for it. Is it a um, audio and video or Yeah, it's both. So I had Yeah, nice. Ray Ortega from ASM come out. Uh, he lives in Sacramento, so he came down to Irvine to film it. And Very so cool. uh we'll have high quality video. Oh, nice. I'll keep an eye out for it. I'd love to see it. Although people, you know, I I look at the videos and while I like doing them, <laughs> um and and I kind of like it because you can see who you're talking to, right? Mm-hmm. But they don't get much download compared to audio, mm-hmm. audio right? <laughs> so, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, maybe if you're lucky, if you get a thousand views on uh, one of these videos that I post mm-hmm. on my YouTube channel. So, I'm just, I just have started to do f- less of them on the road, and mm-hmm. this this time I thought it would be good to have one, but also since Ray's in California, I did it, but. Oh, yeah, perfect. I'm going to Europe in a couple of weeks, and I'm just not going to schlep all my video equipment over and, and do video. I'll just do audio when I do that. Yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, huh, interesting. And I'm going to Cold Spring Harbor next week. There's a retrovirus meeting. Oh, yeah, that'll be fun. And, That's always kind of a spicy one, isn't it? Yeah, so we're going to do the first TWIV at, at the retrovirus meeting, and um, oh. I'm just going to do audio because, again, it's to, it's a lot of setup for me and... um. 
Yeah. I'm not sure that people care too much about the, the video. It's more, it's yeah. No, it's interesting how people consume, um, you know, science, whether it's podcasts or video and sort of the finding that sweet spot of, of an audience and how to relate to it. It's, yeah. it's really interesting. Well, I think yeah. a, a video works if it's kind of short with mm -hmm. a variety of approaches. So if you just have a couple of people talking, right, what we call talking heads, <laughs> uh, it's not so compelling on a video unless you have what we call B-roll, which is video you take elsewhere to illustrate what people are talking about, right? And you you mm -hmm. intersperse it and you make it more interesting. But, you know, mm -hmm. for podcasts, we don't have that most of the time. Yeah, true. Now, I'm going to do, there's a Smithsonian exhibit this for the next few years called Outbreak uh, in, in mm -hmm. Washington. And that is about infectious diseases. Oh, wow. And I'm going to go down there and do a, twiv with the curator right mm, and mm. there you know we'll sit it in front of the exhibit but then we'll have video taken throughout the exhibit which will illustrate what we're talking about so that could be more interesting right yeah but, agree but that's production it takes work right and, oh, yeah. and yeah. um so it's always a, a trade-off right audio is mm. pretty straightforward you just mm. record it and you put it out there mm. and so people consume it when they do other things and that's the beauty of it video you can't be uh, exercising while you're looking at it. i guess you could you could put your phone up there on the thing but <laughs> that's right you can't pipette and do and look at video so, yeah that's right it's a little <laughs> different it's harder to multitask when you've got yeah. video and audio coming at you versus just audio yeah yeah, yeah. true so, Nels, what have you got for us today? Yeah, well, speaking <laughs> of viruses, whether they're <laughs> retroviruses or vaccine strains, we have a, a hybrid cross-training episode today <laughs> on uh, a TwiVivo, if you will. Um, our paper that we'll consider uh, just emerged called Ancient Hepatitis B Viruses from the Bronze Age to the Medieval Period. And this is a paper that just, uh, I think, a couple days ago um, showed up in Nature. Um, it's mostly from a group um, in Copenhagen, Denmark, um, SK Vilislev's lab, a well-known crew um, for considering ancient DNA isolation from uh, things like mummies or even older bone samples from archaic human individuals. And so this is actually this idea of getting viruses or other pathogens um, from these ancient samples is not, it's not new. Um, in fact, we considered this um, <laughs> not too long ago in person on TWIV episode 476. Yeah, that's right. Um, this is, do you remember? This is my last um, mm -hmm. in studio visit to yeah, TWIV right. world headquarters. I, I in fact did that in, intentionally since you were going to be there and you can explain <laughs> all the, the, right. the tip rooting stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Root yeah. Tip. We're going to, well, that's right. We, <laughs> Um, tip to root. We will be covering that again today, and we'll wade through that in a little more depth. By the way, uh, one of the people on this paper is from the Laboratory of Tree Ring Research <laughs> at the University oh, interesting. of Arizona. Yeah, wow, cool. Um, and so, anyway, that snippet that we talked about on um, TWIV was about a 400-year-old um, strain of hepatitis B virus that was found in a, an Italian mummy. Right. <laughs> and if I'm remembering correctly, what was kind of interesting about this was so the mummy, when it was first sort of examined, had all of these sort of pustules or pox marks. And so they were, and they had done some preliminary um, electron microscopy analysis that gave them some evidence or some uh, motivation to consider that they might be able to isolate um, pox virus, smallpox, vir variola virus mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, from the sample. And so they went ahead and we'll kind of delve into some of these ancient DNA um, isolations and then um, analyses. Um, but they didn't find any pox virus DNA. They found instead hepatitis B virus. Right. <laughs> and so... Um, so a hint at one of the, like the possibility, I guess, in this case, I think is about a 400 year old sample. Um, but with today's papers, um, and we'll focus on the nature paper. It turns out there's another, um, related study or over complementary study, I would say, um, by a group in Germany and they put, um, their work up on the bioarchive. Um, we'll get the link up on our episode notes. They are doing something very similar and describe, um, HPV, from a, uh, uh, again, a, a human bone sample that they date to about 7,000 years ago. Mm. So now we're about an order of magnitude, um, you know, back in time. 
going from hundreds of years to thousands of years. And that is pretty interesting, actually, I think, to get a glimpse at a human virus um, that, that or a set of viruses that are emerging from the sort of increasing almost um, cottage industry of in, uh, getting human samples um, thousands of years old and then isolating the DNA and now adding sort of the passengers in addition to our own genomes of our ancestors to ancestral pathogens, including viruses. It's really cool. Yeah, and, pretty fun. And it, as, as you'll tell us, it's kind of a byproduct, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, so, and just kind of getting at the attention this is drawing and, and kind of got this on my radar too, is both um, Carl Zimmer and um, Sarah Zhang uh, wrote some um, articles in the New York Times and the Atlantic about these studies. And sort of one of the provocative titles is that this is the oldest virus sequence. Now, of course, some of our- mm, That's not right. Um, well, some <laughs> maybe old as human virus, right? <laughs> Correct. Yeah. So some of our colleagues um, immediately jumped onto Twitter, which is sort of what we do Good. these days, and pointed out that um, there are a couple caveats to that claim. One is that this is to date the oldest human virus that has been uh, sort of reconstructed, but it's just sequence. Correct. D uh, by sequence has been sequenced. Let's say, mm. um, and um, exogenous virus as well. So. If we look at some other studies, um, there was a few years ago this really exciting and interesting investigation of this giant virus, Pithovirus yeah. Sibiricus, I think it's called. Sibiricum. Sibiricum, yep. Yeah. Um, that I think you covered on TWIV. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And so that was, if um, I'm remembering correctly, was sort of excavated from a sample in like the Siberian permafrost or something like that. Yeah, it was an ice core. Mm, you know, gotcha. they they drill down and get these long cores, you know, about four or five inches in diameter, and they can date them depending mm -hmm. on how deep mm -hmm. they are in the permafrost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this one where they got, you know, they got a piece of ice and the lab in Marseille thawed it out and they recovered uh, the virus and it was 30,000 years old. Yeah, really interesting. So in another DNA virus, um, sort of hinting at the fact that DNA is much more stable, for example, than RNA, mm -hmm. and that you can really, depending on how the samples are preserved, you can really reach back into time, basically. Um, and with increasing sort of um, technology, make a case that you can actually sequence the genomes um, of these um, passengers. So now, let me ask you a question. Yeah, sure. Is it correct to say that you have a virus if you just have the sequence? So, you know, I'm sure these headlines by Zimmer et al. were oldest virus, right? But is it really a virus unless you have an, an infectious particle? Yeah, no, that's a good point. And so, um, um, and um, for a couple things, first to just say that, um, so Sarah Zhang in her article does point that out. So oldest virus ever sequenced is right. in the title. So she does make that distinction. But course, and also just to say, I think she's a great science writer, really. But she wrote the oldest following. virus ever sequenced? She yeah, it comes from a 7,000-year-old tooth. Uh, well, too so, bad uh, yeah. she didn't realize that Sibericum, <laughs> Pithovirus Sibericum is, right? I mean... So far, yeah. Yeah, it's, it is the oldest, not this one. <laughs> yeah, although there is a pretty big difference here, right? So, um, I mean, it is a caveat, but from a, uh, oldest from a human sample. Uh, from a human, sure. That's correct. Fine. Did she it's, point that out in her title? Did she uh, it's not in the title, but it's in the certainly in the article. <clears throat> um, and... Uh, and as I mentioned, plenty of our um, Twitter colleagues, Eddie Boy, Holmes in particular, out, yeah. um, jumped in to, um, and he'll come up in this conversation because Eddie, in our conversation, Eddie Holmes, who's, um, was at Penn State, he now has his lab, I think University of Sydney hmm. in Australia and has done, continues to do a ton of really interesting work uh, thinking about virus evolution um, and uh, sort of also some of these ancient samples that are starting to emerge as well. And we'll, we'll kind of touch on some of these ideas as we keep going. Um, but so as you're saying, that turns out, so I think for the um, Villaslav group in Denmark, um, you know, their main focus has been, they've, um, you know, sort of made some high profile contributions to thinking about human history by sequencing out the, um, taking these bone samples and then recovering enough of the genome to start thinking on the mm. genome scale of assembling these and the putting this sort of together with the archaeological dating of the samples, with the ideas of population genetics for how our species um, emerged and sort of migrated and really, you know, kind of took over the world in some ways. 
Um, and yet, just hanging out in those existing samples is all kinds of, um, you know, let's say passenger DNA. These are the pathogens um, whose genomes in some cases are also preserved. And when you're just doing shotgun sequencing, you're sequencing everything. Uh, if your question is about the human genome, you just throw these things away because they don't align. Obviously they're not integrated into the genome. These are exogenous viruses. And so just going back in a sense to the trash bin and, um, in, in pulling out these gems, is starting to become uh, sort of a really interesting uh, complementary, or I think, you know, depending on your, your interests, maybe this is uh, the human genome is the junk and it's really what's interesting <laughs> are these virus genomes that have. Oh, well, that's a great title, isn't it? Them. The human yeah. genome. <laughs> yeah, we're getting there. So up, up until now, I think the, maybe the most um, extensive studies have not been on viruses from these samples. Um, but instead from some bacteria. And so um, maybe the most considered so far have been the Yersinia pestis genomes that have come out of some of these samples. This is the causative agent of the, the um, black plague. Um, and this has been useful for thinking about the evolution um, of those strains and, and how they've sort of moved through and they come, populations. They come from teeth often, right? Yeah, that's right. And so that's sort of, you know, and, and maybe to say that a lot of these I think there are two main um, bones or um, you know structures that are uh, ground into dust, basically, and then DNA is recovered. They sort of are the hot spots of where DNA is. I think one is the inner ear bone, one that turns out to be really good um, to recover um, host genomic DNA or the the actual human DNA, and then the other is the teeth, as you're pointing out, um, and that also turns out to be sort of you see like the Yersinia strains there. And I think, well, actually, I mean, I'm curious to hear from you. So H, um, HBV is uh, hepatitis. So obviously infecting the li liver, mm. um, in a bloodborne pathogen. So are you surprised to see so much of its DNA in the teeth of these, um, uh, samples in this current study? Is that where they got the, uh, the sequences from teeth? Or, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So certainly from the, um, this German group that's so, and, and to say, I think that preprint, mm. which is up on the bioarchive now is about to convert um, to a paper in eLife, even in the next day or so. So that will be another, mm, yeah. it might be the more polished version might be emerging as well um, of that study. But that one is certainly from um, a tooth. Yeah. Well, as you know, these, this, these hep B infections, they're chronic. They occur for mm -hmm. pretty much the lifetime of the individual. And they are characterized not just by liver damage, but, pretty substantial viremia virus in the blood hmm. and it's not <clears throat> it's not like for a day or two weeks it's years and years and years it's so you die at any time there's some virus in your tooth or in your bone because they're all vascularized and uh, that's where it comes from so uh, you know it's just passing through <laughs> yeah no it makes sense and i wonder if um you know, is it possible that these samples, um, that these people, that's, this is actually how they died. They're so, like the viremia was so high that you could, there is, a, you know, enough of it kind of disseminated mm. that then you come back a few thousand years later and there's still DNA recoverable from the teeth. Yeah, it's could be. I mean, these people can live for many years and they may die of liver cancer or sometimes other complications uh, of infection. So mm. you, can, you can live. Yeah, so it could be the cause of death was related or something else. You know, people uh, that this old died of many other things, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, and that's what, pretty interesting too, right? So you can, I think just from, um, you know, looking at the, depending on how complete the skeletal remains are, mm, yeah, you can start to think about, you know, are there signs of tr blunt force trauma or even other, you know, trauma that you died in some sort of a conflict um, at the hands of one of your own mm. uh you know, individuals in your population, your own species. Yeah. Or if there's no, and you know, and also get a sense of the age of the individual. Um, Sarah in her Atlantic piece makes a really cool, I think the first paragraph is just kind of draws you in by kind of trying to tell the story of the age of the person that where they sampled the tooth and got the virus. And so young, young person, you know, per perhaps no signs of the, uh, other trauma. And maybe that's consistent. You sort of build a circumstantial case yeah. for the, cause of death potentially being the virus. Well, it certainly is known to kill people, right? There's like almost a million deaths a year of hep, from hep B. Yeah, yep. Yeah, and so then another, um, this, the study that we're kind of focusing on doesn't get into it, but um, 
from just a quick glance at um, Carl Zimmer's piece in the New York Times on this, um, he mentions that one of, I think one of the authors in the um, paper in the coming out of the Villaslav group um, is starting to take the sequences that they are reconstructing from the samples and then thinking about synthesizing the ancient virus mm-hmm. to then, you know, put it through, well, to first of all, see if they recover a replication competent virus. And if so, how does it behave? How does it, um, is it, you know, a, a strong, strongly replicating strain? Is it, or what are its features or is it sort of a wimpy mm. strain relative to modern ones that hasn't sort of gone through the last 7,000 years yeah, of you could Im- conflicts and so forth. You could imagine you know? that maybe it might not replicate, right? <laughs> Who knows? That'd be fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. To do. It depends yeah. on the accuracy of the sequence, I suppose. Right. Correct. Yeah. And so that's where, you know, if it doesn't replicate well, so for, you know, it, you could imagine at least two explanations. One is the sort of interesting, kind of, you know, not, not being involved in the last year, 7,000 years of evolution with hosts mm-hmm. or alternatively, have you just, are there sort of errors in the, in the reconstruction since you're, you know, kind of doing your best with a, a, a damaged piece of DNA or collection of DNA that you're shotgun sequencing. We'll get into that. Could it be the other end? Well. Could these really mm-hmm. grow really well in human cells? Well, and so that's, <laughs> <laughs> of course that's worth, excuse me, considering as well. Um, what are the sort of ethical considerations here with, um, you know, sort of in quotes, reviving yeah, um, yeah. a viral strain? You certainly want to think that through and, of course, have sort of the biosafety uh, measures in place um, to consider that. And, um, and you know, I think the conversation is important to have is to, as we gain more knowledge about um, sort of what our ancestors faced in terms of the viruses that um, they were interacting with or dealing with, mm. There's a lot of potential, um, I think, fundamental knowledge or information that might be that might come out of that. How do we predict how viruses might sort of um, evolve and adapt by taking sort of a clue from what has happened in the past, or you know, what what is the diversity of these things? Uh, we'll think about that a little bit. And I think I bet you could yeah. easily take. Maybe you're you're doing this. Take these sequences, and you you must know some cell proteins that interact with some of the viral proteins and look at, you know, host virus conflicts, right? Absolutely. Yep. And I think so that's where, um, for me as a evolutionary virologist, I think there is a sort of incredible potential from doing this research. Now at the same time, I'm very, um, you know, uh, open and also, um, you know, appreciate the concerns that you, we don't want to mm-hmm, mm-hmm. sort of accidentally do some sort of gain of function related stuff as well. And so I think that's a, uh, obviously a conversation that's still happening. I think you can make a pretty good case that things are, have been proceeding, um, pretty carefully, um, so far. And, um, and that if, if you really kind of look at the whole, um, landscape here that we're balancing sort of what can be gained in terms of fundamental knowledge against the um, sort of slight risks that mm-hmm. might emerge mm-hmm. from from doing some of this research, but so obviously now, an ongoing conversation. Now, are there proteins in the Hep B genome sort of analogous to the K3Ls of uh, vaccinia virus mm-hmm. that that you have studied in terms of virus host conflict? Yeah, good question. And I'm not, to be honest, I'm not super familiar with. The, I mean, the, um, HBV, so it's another DNA virus, um, much smaller genome. And in fact, has overlapping reading frames, if I remember mm-hmm. correctly. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is f- uh, fascinating, actually, from an evolutionary standpoint. How do you sort of, if, uh, for a virus that has to adapt to a full kind of onslaught of immune defenses, like all viruses do, um, and then to uh, like to be so streamlined that you basically overlap your reading frames, you can imagine that this sort of boxes in the virus in terms of the um, types of mutations it can sample to still encode viable proteins that have to sort of um, you know, sample space to either defeat or evade, kind of fly under the radar of the immune system. And so, yeah, it's certainly a very different virus, I would say, from the pox viruses. And that's one of the things that attracts me to thinking about um, pox viruses is that you have these sort of, you know, hundreds of genes um, not overlapping. And um, and you can kind of, in at least several cases, like K3L, the, the um, protein that you mentioned, you can really draw a clear definition of the functions what are the exact sort of interfaces between virus and host and so that's what really kind of got me on to that as a um, as a place to focus 
uh, my attention is that we can make pretty strong predictions about how the evolution might um, sort of unfold at very specific host virus interactions. A little harder to do, I think, with some of these super fascinating but kind of multitasking viruses, either overlapping reading frames or encoding proteins that are sort of multitasking in terms of, mm. um, you know, doing tons of interfaces at the same time. It's really, um, yeah, to me, it was, it's just like flying a little close to the sun, um, of trying to decouple all of those, uh, interactions, but, um, a lot of great folks who are um, tackling those questions as well. So th- this idea that the, the genome open reading frames overlap, I don't remember, but maybe they're even on both strands for some viruses. They certainly yeah, that's are. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do we, do we, I mean, we say, yeah, it's going to constrain evolution, but do we, has someone done the calculation and looked at the number and said, well, it's not really, well, that much lower, maybe, you know, X order, X fold, or has anyone done that? Do you know? Yeah, I think so. And I'm not familiar with the details. I mean, I think what is pretty clear is that if you, sort of take different regions of the genome and calculate substitution rates, for example, they will be different. But again, that can be for a number of reasons. So, you know, is this sort of a structural or core virus protein that, um, you Mm -hmm. know, kind Mm -hmm. of is a uh, job that you can't really compromise just to be a replicating virus Mm -hmm. relative Mm -hmm. to something that might be, you know, sort of distracting or entertaining an immune function, which might get caught up in more of sort of a genetic conflict or there might be rapid evolution. Um, yeah, the, it turns out, at least from a, like a sort of a strictly um, computational or phylogenetic approach, yeah, yeah. Um, it's pretty difficult to do um, overlapping reading frames um, just as uh, just sort of on a, the first principle. But I think that's, I mean, it's an opportunity as well to think about that more closely. Yeah. So I think that's a still remains a pretty open question as far as I know. But yeah, I'm looking at the map here of the genome. Let me see. Yeah, so I... let's. Uh, yeah, let's ta- let's tackle. This. Uh, oh, I thought you were looking at the map. Yeah, I'm just seeing if uh, they're on different oh, strands. Strands. Mm. Looks like it's all on one genome organization. Uh, blah blah blah. Looks like it's all on one strand because there are some viruses where both strands are give rise to mRNAs. In particular, mm-hmm. the uh, mm-hmm. polyoma viruses are really out of control there. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. I'm looking at, by the way, principles of virology. <laughs> now we're talking. Yeah. Where the, uh, and of course, adenovirus has transcripts from both strands as well. So that would constrain. And and does pox uh, have transcripts from both strands? Do you know? Yeah. So you do, you end up with um, the open reading frames sort of transcribing in both directions. Mm-hmm. Um, the so-called L and R genes. Right, yeah. And then what ha- ends up happening is as these transcripts are made, they actually in you know they go past the stop so they're not overlapping, but they go past the stop codon just as RNA. Mm-hmm. And then these will anneal and you get double strand RNA. This is like yeah, sort of right. blood in the cytoplasm for the immune or in, <laughs> blood in the water yep. for the um, immune system um, and all these cytoplasmic factors that then um, get perked up or turned on to sort of um, mount an immune response. Perk, huh? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> trying to avoid too many pun possibilities there, yeah, but good. It's hard to. Speaking of maps, so I was thinking of a different map—not the virus um, genome, but the actual figure one, the map of the um, hepatitis B samples that were recovered from these um, bones that were really across the world, actually. Mm-hmm. And so, um, and I think um, they focus here on about twelve samples. They looked at a bunch more. So but basically, they had bronze and Iron Age, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's a pretty big range, actually. Um, hmm. And I think what they did is prioritize based on. So they have, you know, a growing collection of human genomes emerging. Yeah. Ages, you know, they're dating these from 850 years to 4,000 years, basically. And then the question becomes if you go in and pull out the virus sequences, the hepatitis B sequences, how much coverage do you have? How much depth do you have? So how good were the samples just sort of by chance? And then they can kind of prioritize again in their hundreds of samples. And they just, um, I think they lift up about 12 where they have um, good coverage and good depth, although it it ranges quite a bit. So their their best sample, um, which is from uh, an individual that is believed to have lived about 4,000 years ago, they've got 80X coverage of the virus genome. Mm -hmm. 
and um, are able to basically basically get a sequence, a consensus sequence that covers a hundred percent of the genome. So that's pretty good. Yeah, that's yeah, um, that, you could use yeah. that to recover virus, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's what you would, if you wanted to synthesize one of these viruses, you'd probably yeah. use that data. It's a, from an individual, in, again, in Germany, um, a male from the Bell Beaker culture or period, it says in this table, um, or has info about the, the, the individual. Now, would you expect to find some smallpox sequences in these as well? Well, yeah, and so I'm, I would, and I'm kind of dying over here because, you know, <laughs> between the... <laughs> between the um, that mummy that we talked about um, from four hundred yeah. from uh, the Italian mummy. I mean, that's what they were after to begin yeah, with. Yeah, right. And then um, you know, from I think some of the interviews that um, Carl Zimmer had, he hints at the fact that like, kind of stay tuned. Yeah, right. I think we might get um, some really cool um, that they might be onto some really cool um, companion viruses in some of their samples. I wouldn't mm-hmm. be surprised mm-hmm. if we start to see some ancient pox viruses that sort of, I think currently it's, again, it's on that sort of 400 year, um, 500 year time frame, but we might soon see that expand by an order of magnitude. That could be, I think, really interesting to see some of those ancient um, uh, smallpox related viruses and start to think about that history. Um, adenoviruses, I think, are also on the menu mm-hmm. and um, perhaps a few other DNA viruses that are sort of, um, because of the um, DNA, are probably decently preserved. And so mm-hmm. I think right. this is like, yeah, keep an eye on the space. There could be a lot of cool, for um, virologists, there could be a lot of cool stuff coming out. DNA virologists, there could be some really nice um, studies in the works. So, but already with these, um, this sort of collection, in this case of 12 viruses, what you can do then is, um, you know, sort of for, for the first time in a more... Um, kind of substantial way, start to put these together, uh, compare them to modern viruses um, from a phylogenetic perspective. And actually, before we jump into that, actually, I did want to note, um, because this already kind of came up in our conversation, is that, um, you know, one of the obvious sort of challenges or hurdles with this work is how do you know that what you are sampling is, first of all, ancient DNA, and that you are um, sort of Mm. assembling it correctly. Mm. And so, if you go to the um, methods section, they actually note seven points hmm. um, that they worry about um, when they're looking at the, um, the, the these DNA samples and sort of prioritizing ones that they think are not contamination and are um, and, and uh, reflect that they actually are sort of uh, ancient viruses that were truly in those samples um, for the person who um, uh, had or is infected by them. And so these are, I won't go through every single detail here, but they note well, and it's and it's just a reference, but there are, first of all, the, a ton of precautions with working with ancient DNA. You don't want to contaminate not only with, um, you know, the scientist's own DNA, but also if the scientist is infected. Um, one of the first things that you look for from these DNA um, genome sequences is whether there are patterns of um, damage consistent with the DNA being old. So this is cytosine deamination. Um, the C's will just sort of, uh, the cytosines, um, will sort of spontaneously at some rate, uh, flip over to, um, uracil, um, just as the, you know, chemistry basically is unfolding here. And this happened, you see this, um, more commonly at the five prime end, um, of sequences, um, this pattern of deamination. You can see that, um, very clearly in their, um, supple extended data figure, um, consistent with these. Uh, that DNA sort of being around for thousands of years along with the um, remains of the host. They also do um, a number of kind of knock on like PCR related tests to see if they can like diagnose the presence of the virus um, to some level. I think the it ends up, they make the case that actually the genomic sequencing just is a more sensitive um, way of doing this. Although in, in the, some of their top, samples, they do say that they're able to use just even like modern diagnostics where you might be saying, oh, are you infected with HPV, kind of the PCR assay. Mm. Um, And they're able to recover um, even from those samples. Again, I think highlighting just how much DNA there must have been from these viruses, at least in some of those those humans. Um, They also point out that they rec- they aren't so if you were if it was just a point source of modern contamination you would probably then as you do your phylogenetics you would probably just you wouldn't see a lot of diversity it would be whatever you know is the local infection 
And in fact, as we'll discuss it in a little bit of detail, they see a real diversity of the strains, meaning that the sequences sort of arrange or are associated in different lineages or subtypes of hepatitis B virus. And because they're sampling from sort of diverse areas around the world for samples from diverse times, the fact that they recover diverse viruses is also consistent that they're actually, this is their signal here. These are real viruses that they're recovering. Um, Let's see what else this is. I'm only up to 0.5. There's also, (laughs) (laughs) you can, if you really want to go into the weeds here, you can um, kind of look at this. They also make a case for the virology that um, HPV is, as we've been discussing is a bloodborne virus um, transmitted by exposure um, to people who are already infected blood to blood um, or sort of like real contact um, and not through the environment. And so again, just making a case sort of, again, with circumstantial evidence that there's probably not a ton of HPV, um, BV that's going to show up at this, these high levels in some of the cases, um, just by sort of, um, you know, aerosol or just kind of go environmental, uh, kind of considerations. Mm. So anyway, I think that's, you know, um, there's only so much you can do, but at least that just gives a hint of sort of the, um, you know, the things that people who are in this field of ancient DNA, um, sequencing think about, um, when they're tackling these data sets, super challenging, right? Yeah. And, and they often have, facilities dedicated just to looking at ancient DNA and nothing else, right? They'll they'll have a small lab. They'll call it the ancient DNA lab. And there you bring the samples, you do all your extractions, you do your PCR, you do your sequencing, and nothing else goes in there. It has its own dedicated equipment just to avoid, you know, contamination. Yeah, that's right. And you're kind of dressing up in spacesuits and everything, not because you're worried about getting infected necessarily, but because you're worried about contaminating the the, um, thing that you're interested in. Yep. Okay. So then, you know, taking that sort of set of evidence and again, you know, we, as, as you're alluding to Vincent, I think you really do have to think about like, okay, here's the sequence we got, but there is, you know, definitely going to be deamination. There might be other processes. And so how do you distinguish, you know, every base pair, Mm. you know, with true fidelity and that's sort of another issue, but doing the best you can, they then build, what they call a maximum credibility tree. And this is figure two. So it's basically taking a, num- a bunch of modern HPV sequences and you can just go to GenBank, I'm sure, and grab a variety of these. They um, show the different clades, um, these, these strains from Asia, from North America. There is some geography um, to how these things arrange in phylogenetic trees. Um, and then also some outgroups. So things like chimpanzee, um, gorilla strains, modern strains that have been recovered from um, great apes um, out to orangutans and um, gibbons. So then what they do is they basically just add their ancient samples and just see where they arrange in the tree. And so as kind of already mentioned, you you actually see them in several of the clades. So there's some of their viruses ended up in the A group, which is the um, some of the, or associating most closely with some of the modern European strains. Um, some of them, or one of them, I should say, um, associating with an Eastern Asian, the B clade, um, others, um, South America, even um, Central Asia. And then maybe most surprisingly, one that, um, or a set of viruses, I guess three different of their samples that are most closely associated with the chimpanzee mm. clade. <laughs> and so a little bit of a curveball there. And, <laughs> and, uh, and also just to say that. <clears throat> that sort of geography that's in some of the modern clades gets a little bit scrambled um, with the uh, ancient viruses and where they were sampled, the human individuals. And so I think, you know, they make a few points in the paper that this sort of reveals, um, you know, or suggests um, an exchange sort of might between either migrations or that there's this sort of underlying diversity of H. BV that was that has been sort of underappreciated or underrecognized, and so what's going on here? One possibility is that in fact a number of these ancient strains are now extinct, and so you had all these sort of uh, you actually had more diversity, and what we're sampling today is just a subset of that, mm. and so maybe at least some indirect support for that comes from the fact that in three of the cases the virus that it's most closely related to is the um, chimpanzee. Um, gorilla mm-hmm. version. This also, you know, another corollary or um, sort of um, idea that this raises is that there's cross-species transmission 
events that are maybe underappreciated from modern viruses today, um, but in more ancient times. So this, uh, you, these three sequences that cluster with the chimp isolates, so they would have a common ancestor, and so the idea would be that 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 jumped species at some point, either one way or the other. We don't know if it was humans first or chimps first or vice versa, right? Yeah, that's right. And I think, you know, um, there may be more data out there. Um, mm. In some of the supplementals, they, you know, they casted um, a bit of a wider net. So they started um, in their trees to do phylogenetics, you know, with other mammals, actually. I'm forgetting all of the diversity. And then once they saw that the basically among their samples, the one that was farthest away um, were, were these chimp gorilla samples, then they sort of narrowed the phylogenetic window um, to just include these and then mm. do a more um, comprehensive analysis on things like substitution rates and dating. And we'll get into that in a minute, but yeah, you're right. So just by looking at this, it's really hard to say which um, to, well, conclusively to say um, uh, which direction um, these things might've mm. gone. Yeah. And then yeah. the, I yep. And then the idea that these are now um, no longer actually um, well. So the implication, right. Is that, that, um, virus, when it got into humans actually went extinct, we no longer. So if you just, if, yeah, for example, if you just hit modern humans yeah, yeah. who are HBV infected, you don't see these, um, you know, that association with the sure. gorilla yeah. chimpanzee. Yep. I mean, there's a lot of time between these isolates and the, the chimp are contemporary isolates. So that's, you know, thousands of years. So a lot, lot of exactly. things could have happened in there. That's exactly right. The other one that's interesting is in the A sub, in the A genotype, um, you have, you know, mostly, well, it's a mix of African and Asian isolates, right? Mm -hmm. And then you, you've got, um, well, I guess it makes sense because the, the, the isolates they got are Eastern Europe and Central Asia and they, um, I guess they're not part of that because you got Western Europe and Southern Asia, so that's kind of a disconnect in there, right? Yeah, and I think the biggest disconnect is actually, um, you know, if you look at, um, well, and, and to be honest, I think if you really kind of squint at these trees, the uh, tips of the branches, there's already some, um, you know, scrambling basically of the location. So if you look in the D clade, for example, you've got South America. Um, Southern Asia, North America, Western Asia, yeah. and then yeah. um, a couple of these Central Asian ones that sort of are intercalating, um, these ancient ones that are intercalating into the tree. Mm. It's, also, it's also worth noting, you know, so um, the um, if you just look at the, so th with this um, phylogenetic tree, they also try to connect this to the time, to timing, basically what are the substitution rates, and then using several methods. Um, so first of all, the arrangement of the tree uh, I thought it'd be good just to maybe spend a minute um, tackling some of the um, techniques used, at least sort of at a 30,000 foot level. So the entire tree reconstruction is done by maximum likelihood um, sort of statistical uh, confidence for how you just arrange mm -hmm. what, who goes where. And so this involves um, a computational process where you're basically reconstructing ancestral nodes. So you're taking all of that diversity out on the tips of the branches, the modern um, virus sequences, and then asking sort of what is what you infer, what would an ancestor look like given that diversity at each node? So that's just, just basically going back um, to the common ancestor um, of any two samples and then doing that again and again. And that's how you get sort of the deeper branches going all the way back to the root. Do you use some kind of mutation rate, estimated mutation rate to do that? Yeah, you do. So what you use for the maximum likelihood is, well, what you use is actually um, a codon table. So you, you know, you consider um, for that species or that strain, what are, if you just do a sampling again of like sort of modern um, samples, how often do you see for the codons um, for specific amino acids in the whole sort of collection of sequences and that could be genome wide. And very quickly you get a, a sense of the frequencies in the codon tables um, of how often you see those. Mm -hmm. And that's important because you're using basically the degeneracy of the genetic code in some ways to infer sort of what are the, um, or to maximize the likelihood um, that you are basically reconstructing the ancestors to the, you know, based on a sort of statistical argument of this is the easiest path basically to get to this substitution. And so, um, and that matters if you, or the codon, the codon frequencies matter to uh, gain more confidence that you're 
more accurately, more accurately mm. making your reconstructions and then comparing them for the arrangements. And so what you're trying to do is you're fitting models. Basically, I won't again. I won't go all the way into the weeds here. Um, of what is, um, how do you maximize sort of the most likely um, path that these mutations or that diversity kind of tracing back. Uh, went through. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so in basically in the internal or more ancient nodes, you're trying to figure out what are the fewest mutational steps um, that fit the actual data set out on the tips of the branches and then doing model fitting to gain your best sort of, um, you know, inference of what happened. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have to take that with a little bit of a grain of salt. There are going to be mistakes in here. Of course mm -hmm. you can't, um, we don't have a time machine. Um, mm -hmm. but it's interesting. They call this their, uh, maximum credibility tree. So there, you know, there's a lot of data in here actually. And so in addition to just the arrangement, um, of the viruses, then as you're saying, they're also trying to date these things. And so here they're using and figuring out substitution rates and, and actually dating, mm -hmm. um, and correlating that or comparing that to the, um, dating, the archeological dating of the human samples. These were recovered from, right. And so if you look, there are these on the tree, there's also these kind of gray, horizontal lines and these are um um which and just to say the sort of working from left to right is sort of like from ancient to um contemporary in time in years and so this tree that they've built goes back fifteen thousand years to today and then if you look at those gray lines especially in the deep branches um these are 95 co uh, percent confidence intervals mm -hmm. basically mm -hmm. of the dating that they're pr proposing some of them are pretty long <laughs> There you go. So that's the point I'm trying to make <laughs> is there's um, a lot of uncertainty here, even at 95% confidence, right? Especially in those deep nodes where that thing is, uh, you know, probably 5,000 years, maybe more for that's yeah. one third of the whole data set there. And so, or the whole time that's, that's yeah. considered. And so that's an important, you know, just to kind of keep in mind as we look at these trees and sort of, I think it's sometimes, you know, it's easy to kind of draw these things and say, well, it's evolution is what happened and have this confidence. But in fact, and especially for virus sequences, we have all this sort of volatile evolution with high substitution rates and so forth. Yeah, um, yeah. Easier said than done. And this is sort of the state of the art in some ways. Of course, as we get more samples, this will imp they will redo the calculations and presumably get smaller confidence intervals, right? Yeah, that's the hope. And this is, you know, this is, this is the work that um, a lot of evolutionary biologists are doing population mm -hmm. geneticists are doing whether it's viruses or you know even for our own species so yeah, it, we, yeah. we might have talked about this sometime recently that there's a pretty big revision in the timing of um, what is considered the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees sort of our closest extant mm. living relative among the great apes um, that got moved or you know or maybe a million or two million years back <laughs> to what, it, what people were saying even a year ago. Um, and so, yeah, this is, um, this isn't sort of in stone. This is, yeah, um, yeah. Worse, this is an active area of research. And in fact, for viruses, there's this, also this interesting kind of paradox almost that's emerged when trying to think about substitution rates based in part on now recovering either ancient viruses like these ones, um, or the endogenized viruses, right? So in some genomes where as we're doing more and more sampling um, we find evidence of these molecular fossils mm -hmm. or basically viral fossils that get integrated mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. in kind of rare events or for retroviruses obviously all the time um, and so what's emerged from these observations and analysis is basically this paradox where you look at these viruses that you can date to in some cases you know millions maybe 20 million years ago based on the um um, the uh, who which genomes still retain them in modern species so you infer that it was a single event because if you find it in birds and you know bats is a bad example but um th then you can um, estimate the last common mm -hmm. ancestor if that virus is in the same place at these di highly diverged species then that makes that virus at least that old yeah so then the disconnect comes when you look at that you can first of all you can see you can compare that to a modern virus and see that oh yeah this is very obviously not only this um sort of virus type but even a strain in some cases yeah and yet if we look at the very tips of the trees and estimate substitution rates and then extrapolate back there shouldn't be any sign of that virus at all yeah. because these things are changing so that's much. right so that's right. yeah we shouldn't, and so we this shouldn't is, recognize it basically right exactly yep yeah. and so this has been coined the time dependent rate bias <laughs> uh, <laughs> sort of maybe reflecting um 
that it is a bit confusing both in how it's described and how, how mm, we think about yeah. it so far. In this case, so, in this case, yeah. they didn't have any endogenous elements, right? For because I didn't find them in this paper. Yeah, they didn't. They don't mention that. So, I'm, I'm, so certainly there are endogenous elements um, for Hep B. Oh, for Hep B? No, no, I don't think so. Yeah, and they certainly. Um, I yeah, it's a good question. I don't know. Um, how closely they looked, yeah. but among, so basically what you'd be looking for among the sequences um, of HBV, which they do pull out is whether or not there are any sequences with break, so-called breakpoints, where basically mm -hmm. you're, you're reading along the sequence and it's virus, virus, virus. And all of a sudden out of nowhere comes some host, host yeah. sequence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That becomes a little bit tricky too, because then you have to, you know, there are certainly artifacts in, yeah. Um, yeah. as you're building your genomic libraries and so forth and doing the shotgun sequencing. So you kind of have to be, a little cautious with that, but yeah, no, they don't. As far as I remember, they don't mention that. Or we uh, did, we did a recent, how close we did look. a recent paper on uh, where they ident identified lots of new RNA viruses from various vertebrates, right? Because most of them that we have are from mammals and and birds, but they went all the way back to jawless fishes, and in some cases, they had endogenous viral elements that they could use to calibrate their clocks. Yeah, that's cool. So that's also this fellow Eddie Holmes. That yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. I think that was a study from his crew. Yep. Yeah. And lots of, I think one of the surprises there were lots of sort of name brand viruses um, showing up in fish. Yeah. Like, like influenza viruses. Right? Yeah. I love it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 I have to say, I think currently um, from vi thinking of virology, some of the aquatic hosts are a little under appreciated. Absolutely. And, totally. Yeah. 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 Yep. Now, in this in this uh, maximum credibility tree, <laughs> so we have fifteen thousand years at the root, right? Mm -hmm. Does that mean that's about when these viruses emerged into humans? Yeah, or let's see. So I'm just looking at this. It looks like more like what they're. I mean, again, given sort of those long confidence intervals, if we just look back, so the human viruses trace to about um, ten thousand years. Mm -hmm. If you look at that node and then the next group out um, that you split off to the chimpanzee gorilla viruses. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I would take the, any of this dating with a grain of salt. So um, I, uh, but yeah. given that caveat somewhere between 10 and 15,000 years ago, it could have been that the virus entered humans from a, a non-human source. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. And then, but so then you have that sort of the funny, Appearance, the green, uh, illustrated in green, of the three samples yeah. that they found that then show up, right? They're so, if the, everything was sort of behaved as a single event or, or you know, also keep in mind that this is not exhaustive sampling of- mm, um, By no means, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and so they're what's missing from the, who, where, yeah, you know, and so you're kind of just doing the best you can with the data that you're considering. Um, but what's really- you know, cool about this. And I think why this is sort of, you know, gained a lot of attention is that because you can sort of match that archeological um, base dating, like the carbon 14, how old are the individuals? And then kind of calibrate that with the substitution rates that you calculate just from the differences in the um, sequence, the using sort of the, this coalescent, the idea that you take all of the diversity or the variation in your samples and then work backwards um, using mathematics to figure out um, what did the uh, common ancestor look like. Mm -hmm. And that's that kind of gets to the idea of how you propose, first of all, substitution rates, and then put that onto a molecular, calibrate molecular clocks. Here, what's cool is though, you know, if you look just how the tips, at all the tips of the branches, right? So if we go to time zero, that is um, all of those modern species. And so the dozen or so samples that they add here don't go to the tip because those were... Obviously, um, they're dating them to have um, uh, been, those are like bona fide ancient sequences. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in sort of an idealistic um, view of the tree, you might actually put them not as their own tips, but back in somewhere in the nodes. And you can kind of see that they're, um, you know, like if we look at the, maybe the, up at the top of the tree, the clade A, mm -hmm. there are all these red viruses that they're sort of. Um, putting into the um, the branches as opposed to the tips of the branches mm. of the tree. And yet these things also end sort of at their own 
tips yeah. again, yeah. there's, you know, and so that's, and that reflects that you, d- you have sort of a limited sampling here. And so it's, it's almost a hybrid phylogenetic comparison of basically taking all of your sequences and treating them as modern, even though some of them are ancient. And that's just sort of a compromise for mm-hmm. dealing uh, for how we um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, can kind of calculate these things. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't think we're going to have thousands more of these ancient sequences. Right. So, well, I don't know. So that's a good question. So we'll, um, it's not just um, there's several labs that mm-hmm. are in, in, I would say it's a, this is a growing field of ancient DNA um, analysis at genome scale. And so um, there are a lot of uh, groups teaming up um, to really scour um, a lot of the human diversity. And I mean, if we look at how fast this technology has moved, I'd say in the last decade mm-hmm. from thinking about the Neanderthal sequences, the, Denisovans and other groups, um, people are really going for it. And so if I think combining like the greater sampling or connecting the, um, bone samples to then more and more labs. And if, if the technology gets even more sensitive, um, at, um, I think it's driven mostly obviously by the currently by our, our interest in our own species history. Um, but I think, you know, we're glimpsing at the possibility that we'll have a, a really a lot more on our hands, even in the next maybe five or 10 years. And so, I think there's more to more to come, um, both different viruses, but also um, really a, a better sense of uh, the sampling out there mm-hmm. just as we get better at recovering these things. And so this might help with some of the um, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. current questions yeah. of how do we resolve these substitution rates sort of in the modern branches versus the more ancient ones. There might be some almost intermediate forms, so to speak, from the fossil record. Right. Yeah. It's good stuff. Yeah. Pretty fun. Anything else here that we should touch on? Yeah, I think that basically covers it. So I think, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm excited to see some other viruses that I think we might hear from um, soon. So they say that Watch their data space. support a scenario in which all present day diversity of hep B arose only after the split of old world and new world genotypes. So in other words, the Americas versus the rest of the world, right? Right, right. Well, and there, the, I think what they're talking about is old world and new world monkeys, if I'm um, interpreting this correctly. And so that's like some of the supplemental trees. Yeah, right. The fact that they don't see them um, outside of the great apes, um, the uh, there is that sort of surprise of seeing it um, associate with the gorilla chimp modern strains. Mm-hmm. But then mm-hmm. they don't, um, you know, they did, I wouldn't say this is exhaustive sampling yet, yeah. but there aren't any that show up with, say, you know, the African green monkey strains or the um, squirrel monkey strains, which would be a new world. Yeah. So that's, that kind of allows you to narrow the window at least so far. Yeah. Very interesting. I also think that having some other viruses in the mix are going to, it's going to help because there may be anomalies with they have B that complicate things as we talked about overlapping frames and so forth. Yeah, I agree. And I also think, you know, maybe building on that idea that as we get more viruses, then you get this kind of more um, depth or texture to the kind of data set. So if we, even if you're, if you're most interested in human history by having these comparison points mm-hmm. and knowing, you know, something about how these viruses transmit, whether it's bloodborne or aerosol, um, and then kind of comparing both the sort of geographic and, um, you know, sort of geologic um, uh, versus the timing of these things, then you can start to um, have a complementary circumstantial data about our own human migrations and contacts between different peoples yeah, yeah. based on the virology and the, and the um, replication styles of the viruses. And so that I think is really promising actually mm-hmm. for um, kind of this data informing not only how sort of viruses have evolved, how our own, but also how our own, uh, you know, the history of our species and these mm-hmm. um, conflicts with pathogens that have had such a consequential uh, impact. One last thing, Nels, on, uh, that, that paper we did on TWIV, uh, the 400-year-old HPV, mm-hmm. one of their conclusions was when they can compare that sequence with contemporary hepatitis B, all right, remember, this is all before the current paper that we're discussing now, they could not detect the temporal structure. Yeah. But now with these, we can. So why is that? Because simply we have more of them? Correct. That's So when you just have one compared to, you know, all of these modern things, it's really hard mm-hmm. to 
um, sort of see the patterns there. And so I wouldn't say this like solves that, but it definitely uh, puts it on a bit of a stronger footing to have that um, increased sampling. And in fact, independent sampling. So we didn't go into um, depth about the, so, so far. The oldest one is actually not in this study. Um, but this complementary study by the German group that's 7,000 years old. Yeah, and so yeah. basically that's what really helps is to have a wide range of timing to then start to correlate that. And so I won't go too deep into it, but they do this, um, what they call, um, and this is a common um, method that's been around in the field of phylogenetics for a while, but it are these um, tip to root regression analysis mm-hmm, that gets mm-hmm. you at substitution rates. Um, and so the more data points you have, the better your regression statistical analysis can be. Um, and that's, it's in the extended, there's a nice graph of that, um, for this study. Um, it's where it has time on the X axis and then substitution rates on the, um, uh, Y axis. And then mm. I think three different statistical methods, maybe extended figure five or something like that. Um, w- which shows sort of how, uh, the nuts and bolts basically of how you do some of that, um, temporal resolution. We don't know where that German sample fits on this, uh, phylogenetic tree, right? No. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Good question. Um, could probably take those two data sets um, and then start to merge them. Mm. And yeah, that's a good, good point. I think that would be a really interesting. Yeah, it would be, it would be. Yep. Yep. To see how kind of complementary or even, you know, conflicting the data is at this stage. Twivivo, huh? Twivivo. We've, we've been cross training. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty fun. All right. Should we move on to the mailbag? Bet. There's one there. I think you should take it. Okay. Um, Daniel writes, I'm a neuroscientist to be at Penn State College in medicine in, of Medicine in Hershey, Pennsylvania. I'm sending this message primarily to thank you and Nels for a wonderful podcast. Aside from seminars and other departments, I don't really have many opportunities to get to know other areas of science. And listening to Twivo has given me the opportunity to do just that. Your chemistry and conversations make this podcast a blast to listen to, and I've recommended it to my friends and even my mentor. I'll be waiting for the Twivo swag. <laughs> There's more to read here, but thank, <laughs> thanks, Daniel. And um, I have to say, Vincent, I just ordered um, about a dozen Twivo mugs, so I'll try to get one off to you, Daniel. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got your address here at the bottom, so I can, I'll try to c- connect on that. Um, Daniel goes on, so I'm relatively new to the podcast universe, and Twivo is my first step into the Twix world. You can be sure that it won't be my last. I'm really looking forward to exploring parasitism and virology as well. In a previous episode, you expressed an interest in being a podcast or in beginning a podcast focused on insects. That would be wonderful. Once you're podcasting exclusively, do you expect the Twix series to expand and explore any other scientific niches, niches, perhaps neuroscience? I certainly hope you have more opportunities to explore brain evolution on Twivo. I think that question's for you, Vincent. Well, I don't know, um, Daniel. I'm kind of booked. <laughs> 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 I would love to do more, but um, mm-hmm. I don't think I could continue having a lab at the moment. Yeah. So yeah. that, you know, I don't know how long I'm going to have a lab. Mm-hmm. Um, at least two more years, but um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. beyond that, I don't know. And I, I just think that uh, I have to not do any new ones right now <laughs> because yeah, I, I I just have uh, don't don't have a lot of time and I can't do I can't keep up with some of the reading that I want to do and so forth. So mm-hmm. I mean, if I could get some help in production, that would really be a boon. But mm. you know, we haven't been able to raise enough money to do that, so I'm still working on it. So yeah. for for now, you know, we have five or six and. We'll go with that for a while. Maybe, who knows? Maybe some of them will, will, will sunset and then we can do some other ones. You know? <laughs> That's right. And I have to say, so, um, well, first of all, at five or six, that is um, uh, really incredible, I have to say, to keep those, to keep juggling all of those topics. Um, I'm also really encouraged. So I recently um, locally had a, um, was part of a podcasting workshop mm-hmm. um, or panel discussion and sort of drew people not only from the university, not, not just in biology, but also from kind of widely in the university community and even in um, Salt Lake City, actually. And the conversation was really interesting and, and inspiring. So a lot of students coming up who are thinking about, um, you know, starting their own podcasts, and I think really creative and interesting ways 
um, connected to science in some cases, um, but really kind of innovating in mm-hmm. how mm-hmm. they're connecting the ideas and the themes to the general public. Um, and so I have to say, like, you know, that's also like, really comforting in a way almost that there's so many people who are going to pick up and take up, I think, important topics like these um, kind of all over the place and that we are in store for a lot of um, great podcasts to come. Yeah, I think it's great that people do that. Um, it's important to continue, of course, right? Mm. And I think a lot of people that start them don't realize, you know, what they're getting, into. what it takes to keep going. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, you know, I really enjoy all of them, and but on the other hand, it certainly takes time away from other things, right? So you mm-hmm. you do have to make that decision. You know, I could have had much bigger lab than I do now, probably if I hadn't done any of these podcasts, but I chose to do them because I think it was important. Yeah. And, you know, I'm pretty advanced in my career, so that's okay. But if you're just starting, just, you know, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. I, <laughs> I'm i sympathetic yeah. to that idea as well. Although I will say that for some of, um, even kind of the, um, some of the students that I've been talking to um, and, you know, maybe encouraging pushing over the cliff i won't quite say but to do um to think about podcasting is how useful it can be um just as as scientific training actually to start to think about yeah for sure how you um prioritize in a sense like what are the conversations you want to have and how do you want to have them that um decoupling i think the bench science in some cases or really the technical side of um what we mostly do in our training for example in phd programs from communicating science. Um, and these are, you know, uh, having some training in both, uh, as opposed to sort of doing, uh, you know, the vast majority in how we conduct science at the bench from day to day, mm-hmm. um, can be pretty useful as well. And so I think it's time well spent. Um, although I also agree that the, um, you know, running sort of a podcasting empire of five or six, um, podcasts, with episodes in some cases every week, that's a whole different ball game. I, w- I should say originally I had envisioned having a science podcast production company mm-hmm. where we had people doing the tech, right? And we could also help other people produce their podcasts so that we could do a lot of fields like neuroscience and so mm-hmm, forth. Mm-hmm. I would not have to be part of that, right? I, mm-hmm, we mm-hmm. could just say, hey, we'll do your podcast. We'll record and edit and post for you. And I think a lot of scientists would like that, right? Yeah. But again, I never grew the business to the point where I could do that. And maybe it will happen at some point. I don't mm-hmm. know. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, it's a matter of getting started. You know, we need a kind of a donor to give us a bolus of money. And then we can get more money based on mm-hmm. that, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Kind of hit a sort of uh, catalyze it and sort of hit a yeah turning point. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. you know, if Bill Gates is listening. That's right. You know, we're we're here. We're here. We could use, uh, and then we'll hire. I w- so th- I would hire two people: a business person mm-hmm. to run the business, raise money, get ads, and so forth, so that it will self-sustain, and then a production person to yeah. do all the recording, editing, posting, and so like this episode that we're recording today is Thursday. Mm-hmm. Because of my schedule, I'd probably won't get it up till Saturday. Right, mm-hmm. but it should go up sense. today, like an hour after mm-hmm. we record it. That would be ideal. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that that's kind of my dream yeah. for Microbe TV. Cool. Mm. Stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. We'll keep hustling. Okay, let me get back to Daniel's note. So he continues on another note. Uh, the subject of annotation seems to come up pretty frequently with your guests. As some of them have had to annotate the genomes of their own model organisms. I'm thinking back to the Raider Ant episode. Some of your lis- listeners, myself definitely included, might be interested in learning what goes into the process of genome uh, or transcriptome annotation. If you'd like to pair that with a paper, the following URL has an interesting study published in eLife that just popped up on my radar uh, with a link there. The authors are focused on annotating genes with alternative open reading frames, Their findings suggest the presence of functional proteins in humans and other species that we didn't even know about, some of which are conserved even in yeast. Give it a look. I think it will make some cool material for an episode, though I'm sure you already have quite a few scientists line up and waiting for the Tuivo bump. (laughs) P.S. I'm an Asimov fan, 
And I was happy to find that your episode number one pick of the week was the Foundation Series prequel. It's awesome that so many of the lofty goals we work towards in science were dreamed up by science fiction authors. Without these creative dreamers, we might not live, or we might live in a pretty different world. Sincerely, Daniel. Yeah, Daniel, thank you. Great letter. Um, and thanks for the encouragement. Um, and you're right. So genome annotation is obviously sort of a fundamental um, uh, technical, but also scientific sort of enterprise here that can lead to sort of both new insights as you're lifting up with this uh, eLife paper on alternate open reading frames. Um, but then also when you take these like massive shotgun sequences, actually not only DNA, but also integrating them or merging them with transcriptomic data is, is really useful. And then using different flavors of technology. So the, in addition to the sort of major um, Illumina uh, based technology, the short reads in paired ends to take some of the more uh, newly emerging long reads. So either pack bio and or Oxford nanopore, when you start to merge these data sets, we're really uh, on a nice cusp of bringing high quality de novo genome annotations to a lot of the diversity around us. And so that's another area where we're kind of poised um, as I would say um, evolutionary curious scientists to make some real advances as well. So we'll, and I uh, stay tuned because I'm sure you'll continue to see those themes emerging on our podcast as we continue on. Nice letter. Yeah. Thank great you. One. All right. Should we move on to science picks of the week? We should. That's right. What have you got Nels? Well, and this, um, cross-training to a vivo theme. I've got viruses on my mind. Um, and another echo of Eddie Holmes here showing up again. So um, I was just browsing through my Twitter feed and hat tip here to Daniel Entz um, for pointing me to this um, cool preprint on virological sampling of inaccessible wildlife using drones. <laughs> it's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great, isn't it? And so it's just actually the thing that gets you is just this almost five second video clip um, that you can, if you follow the link and go to the supplemental material, that's it's the video comes up and it's basically a drone camera. It's flying over, you know, the ocean um, and it comes up on a, maybe a humpback whale um, that is, um, you know, coming to the surface and you have all of this water, all this mist coming from the blowhole of the whale and the drone is, has a little open kind of container that flies through the mist and then you see it snap closed. And it's just this great moment of, um, you know, sampling that environmental sample or it's associated obviously with the, uh, um, uh, the whale breathing. And so the, um, implication is that that <laughs> drone will just fly back to the scientist boat, um, uh, probably to the laboratory that they'll do some metagenomics to see who are the viruses associated with the mist of the um, humpback whales blowhole. So cool. I just love Isn't it. Isn't that nice? First of, all, first of all, whales are amazing, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and this is, they're all, there's three of them there. They're all spouting, right? They must have just said, hey, let's go up and get some air. <laughs> <laughs> and they got this one and the thing gets sprayed. Ah, oh, it's so cool. Yeah. Drones are amazing. They're revolutionizing everything. Yeah, science in action there. Holy cow, that's just great. I love it. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> How about you, Vincent? What's your science pick of the week? Well, mine is a little more mundane. Um, <laughs> it's a new science channel on YouTube started by The Verge. Now, some of you mm -hmm. may know The Verge. They are a big, brand new, well, I guess now they're a few years old, news service, right? They started mm -hmm. uh, something brand new, and they did very well. Mm -hmm. And now they have started a science channel. They have four videos there so far. Mm -hmm. It's called Verge Science. And so if you like science communication, you know, here's the idea of short videos. You know, they're less than 10 minutes, four, five, seven minutes long with a person narrating a specific topic. They have slime mold, uh, launching of spacecraft, human vision, blood types. So this shows what you can do with good production values. And, you know, the thing that I really like is that, I, you know, I've had a YouTube channel, mm -hmm. I don't know, for eight years or seven, six years. And I'm really proud that I have, I'm coming up on 14,000 subscribers, right? Here, Verge wow. Science, they started this two weeks ago. They already have 38,900 subscribers. So it's the power of already having a huge subscriber base, right? 
yeah. which you can do. Yeah. So looks interesting. I just subscribed myself. Yeah. So yeah. check that out. Verge cool. Science. And then you know, we would have liked them to hire us to do this, but <laughs> well, stay tuned. You, you never know. Yeah, you never do know. <laughs> yeah. All right, that is Twevo thirty one. You can find it at microbe.tv slash Twevo, which is where the show notes are if you want links to anything that we talk about. And of course, if you have a a mobile device, you listen to your podcast on a player, just search for Twevo and subscribe. Nels and I, every month we talk about This Week in Evolution, and you should listen. Help us out by subscribing. If you really like us, think about donating. We'd love if you gave a buck a month. It would really help us. You can, yeah, that'd be great. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute and send your questions and comments to Twevo at microbe.tv. You can find Nels at cellvolution.org. You can also find him on Twitter where he is L Early Bird. Thanks, Nels. Hey, thank you. Um, good to cross train to a Vivo hybrid episode. <laughs> <laughs> Always good to cross train. That's right. Oh, and and by the way, yeah. I think you're about to mention our um, the music, yeah. the little snippet we have, Trampled by Turtles. A uh, new album just landed that I was listening to the last few days. Really nice one, actually. That's worth checking out, too, if you like the sort of modern bluegrass. It's our introductory and outro music, tramplededbyturtles.com. Mm-hmm. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Evolution, the podcast on the biology behind what makes us tick. Thanks for joining us. See you next month. Till then, be curious. Be curious.